Is this emergency? She's gone off in a car with somebody. Somebody picked her up in a car or something. Okay, what's the name of the child that's gone missing? April Jones. How old is she? Five. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by this dark case. April Jones was born on April 4th, 2007 in McKinleth, Wales. She came into the world seven weeks premature. She started her life in intensive care due to a fit that left her with cerebral palsy on the left side. However, she thankfully pulled through. She lived with her parents, Paul and Coral as well as her older siblings Jasmine and Harley in a small but comfortable home. April's family described her as outgoing and determined to achieve big dreams. This was despite her condition. McKinleth is a close-knit community. Parents felt it was safe for their children to play on their own without supervision, but little did they all know their sense of safety was about to be shattered. On the evening of Monday, October the 1st, 2012, the Jones family had a routine trip to their local leisure centre. It was swimming lesson day for five-year-old April. After the lessons, April and her friend returned to their house where their father, Paul, whipped up dinner for the two little girls. The laughter filled the air as they played on their bikes in the fading daylight. As evening set in, Paul and Coral sent April's older brother, Harley, to pick her up as it was time for her to come home. However, when Harley returned a few minutes later, his screams cut through the calm evening. He cried that someone had taken April, she had climbed into a van, and then she was gone. The family immediately called the police for help. In mere minutes, the police arrived at the residence. They launched a desperate effort to find the little girl. Meanwhile, April's mother reached out to relatives and friends delivering the bad news. Among those she contacted was April's older sister, Jasmine. She was at the local youth club at the time. The moment Jasmine heard of her sister's abduction, she sprinted through the streets, coming home to a scene of utter chaos. The entire community had rallied round to help the police in search for April. With torches in hand, they scoured the pitch black October night. They knocked on doors, peered into garages and explored every street and alleyway. In an effort to spread the news to more people, April's disappearance was shared all over social media. This created widespread awareness and it urged people to be on the lookout. Search parties quickly formed and concerned citizens began scouring local forests. They were all driven by a deep-seated sense of community and worry for the five-year-old girl. The efforts were magnified by the cold, darkness and heavy rain that gripped the area, conditions that no one, let alone a young child, should have to endure. As the hours passed and the search pushed into the early hours of the following morning, the police had no choice but to order the volunteers to stop their efforts due to the harsh conditions and unsafe weather. But the volunteers refused to stop. They were determined to bring April home. Looking back on that harrowing night, April's mother Coral would later recall with a heavy heart, saying, There is great pride in how many people helped us to look for April. As the search for April continued, the police turned to the seven-year-old friend who April had been playing with, a girl who had witnessed the abduction. The young witness recounted that April had willingly entered the car but that she had gotten into the wrong side, and this struck the police as an important clue. The abductor's car must have been a left-hand drive. When this new information was shared with April's parents, they immediately had a person in mind. In this small community, left-hand drive cars were exceptionally rare, 
It didn't take long for the locals as well as the parents to focus their suspicions on one man, Mark Bridger. He was a 46-year-old resident of the town known for his border collie dog. Bridger had been a part of the community for years. He had six children with four different women, though none of his children actually lived with him. However, a few of his children attended the same primary school as April Jones. This could be a further connection. It was revealed that Bridger had a troubling history. He had a string of convictions for minor offences dating back to the mid-1980s. At the age of 19, he was convicted of firearms offences and theft. He had moved to Wales in the 1980s and got additional convictions for criminal damage, a fray, and for driving without insurance in 1991. The following year, he faced another conviction for driving while disqualified and for driving without insurance once again. In 2004, he was convicted of battery and threatening behaviour, and in 2007, he received his fifth conviction, this time for assault. Bridger appeared to be a highly inconsistent man, struggling to maintain steady employment for long periods, and facing a long history of failed relationships. He had a broad range of jobs such as stints as an abattoir worker, a hotel porter, a fireman, lifeguard, mechanic and welder, but none of these seemed to work out for him in the long run. The day before April's disappearance, his current girlfriend had ended their relationship, possibly due to his ongoing struggle with alcoholism. The police also identified the vehicle that he drove, a left-handed Land Rover. Listing Mark as a person of interest, the police began watching him closely. On the morning of October 2nd, 2012, just a day after April's abduction, a police helicopter spotted Mark walking his dog. What struck the authorities as interesting was his unusual behaviour. He never once glanced up at the helicopter. An instinctive response when an aircraft is in the sky above you. I don't know about you, but I can't help but look. This suggested he was aware of the possibility of being watched, but he was trying to play it too cool, and he might have had something to hide. Police officers were dispatched to his residence to see whether April might be held there. Upon entering Mark's home, they were met with strange conditions. The interior was uncomfortably warm. A blazing fire roared in the fireplace. This was even though Mark wasn't there. A strong odour of bleach hung in the air. It was impossible to overlook the fact that the house had been heavily cleaned, and this was done just moments before their arrival. The mounting evidence, Mark's suspicious behaviour, and his ownership of the left-handed vehicle led to his arrest on October 2nd, 2012 on suspicion of abduction. The moment he was caught, he said, I know what this is about. During police questioning, Bridger admitted his involvement in April's disappearance, but his account of events were quite different from the eyewitness testimony of April's seven-year-old friend. Bridger claimed that he accidentally hit April with his car. All of the evidence suggests that you have abducted April. It happened exactly the way I tell you. I did not abduct April. I don't know where she is. Yesterday, I came down to see my daughter's teacher. She had a um, parents' evening. And I then parked up opposite my girlfriend's house, which I believe is not far away from April's mother and father's house. Stupid. I'd had a few to drink, and there was two girls on their bikes. I remember the dark-headed girl came behind the car. I looked to see where the other girl was, and I couldn't see this other little girl. And the next minute, the bike was there. I'd started the car up. As I went to pull away, the car, it, there wasn't a thud, I can't understand. The car rose up. As I opened the car, I walked around. And underneath the front of the car, is now, I know to be April. She was only little. So I picked her up and I put her across my seat and put her in what is the offside seat, the, the passenger seat. <laughs> Tried to take her pulse and there was nothing. I put my mouth over her mouth and went to blow, put my hand back on the chest and that's when I realised 
One side of her chest wasn't there. I'd obviously crushed. I'd obviously crushed her little body. So I then drove out of Brinnagorg. I remember driving down the back road. My intention was to get her medical help. I ended up at the monument in Mach. So what have you done there then, Mark? I've then gone down by the railway station. I've turned round, I've ended up, I'm at the clock. And I remember her still being in the car. And that's when I realised. It's okay, Mark. The colour had gone out of her. Okay, her right. Her lips were purple. Paul and Coral are friends of mine. And I... I've killed their daughter. So when you've got to the monument, yes. is she in the car? I'm trying to jog my memory to know what I, I've done. Okay. It's okay, Mark. The next minute, and I'm in my house, and she's not there. Been upstairs, and I can't find her. I wouldn't have ditched her. I know that. I wouldn't have. I'd have put her somewhere, but I can't remember what I've done. We need to find her. I don't know where I've put her. I'm going to stop the tape now. It's 18.45. Okay. Which led him to pick her up and put her in a car because her injuries were too severe. He claimed that he had attempted CPR but soon realised it was too late to save her life. This version of events, however, was in direct contradiction to the young friend's statement. She had told the police that April willingly got into the car with no mention of an accident. And you tell me that when you get out of your vehicle, that you look underneath the vehicle and you see April. Yes. We have a witness that was present. This person says April got into the Land Rover via the driver's door, which on a normal car would be the right hand side. But that's really the passenger side door on your car. That is complete fabrication and lies. It can't have happened. Mark, is it a case that what you're telling us didn't quite happen? It happened exactly the way I'm telling you. That person is lying. I did not abduct April. I'd like you to go away. And do the tests on the car. You mentioned earlier about hiding her from the rain. I wouldn't have buried her. I would have covered her or put her somewhere under shelter. Are there locations that are personal and private to you that you would have laid April? There's a, a cycle track just above my house. But I most certainly don't recollect being up there. The time by my watch is... 2200 hours. This is going to be the final interview for tonight. Yes. It's been a tough day. Okay. Obviously, she hasn't been found yet. No, she hasn't been found. We need to bring her home. I know. If I really honestly knew where she was, I would tell you. We've only got your version of events. We've only got your word to say that you run her over and that you've killed her. I can promise you that she's not alive. I can't change my story. It's what happened that night. Mark, we don't want her to suffer anymore. Following Mark Bridges' confession, the police pressed him for information on the whereabouts of April's body. He claimed that on the day of her disappearance, he had been drinking heavily and he was too intoxicated to remember where he had placed her. He insisted that he had acted in a panicked, drunken state when he had disposed of her body. While the police had their doubts about Bridges' account, he had no apparent motive to lie about April being deceased. They passed on this horrifying information to the family, 
This left them in a state of shock and sorrow. Despite their pain, they desperately wanted to discover the truth about what had happened to their April. With this, the police initiated a search for April's body. Specially trained cadaver dogs were deployed to comb through ditches, rivers and forests, all while Mark Bridger remained in custody. Meanwhile, forensic examinations were carried out in Bridger's cottage home. The examination revealed evidence of a cleanup, particularly in the bathroom area. On October the 5th, 2012, the police officially reclassified the case as a murder inquiry. They now had reason to believe that April Jones was no longer alive. You may remember I mentioned earlier that upon entry into Mark's house, the police had noticed the unusual warmth caused by the fire. This prompted a closer examination of the fireplace, and there, bone fragments were discovered. These fragments were put under forensic scrutiny. They were later confirmed to be human. The police began to piece together a theory. Mark had taken April's life and disposed of her body by burning it in his own fireplace. After incinerating her remains, he had scattered the ashes and bone fragments across various locations in the town. These included rivers, ditches and forest areas. As forensic investigators continued to search the cottage, they made another discovery. Due to their minuscule size, these particles couldn't be definitively linked to another person. However, a substantial amount of blood was found near the fireplace suggesting that April had suffered great harm within that cottage. To gather more evidence, all of Mark's possessions, including his phone and laptop, were seized for examination. It was during the scrutiny of his laptop that the police had stumbled upon a discovery and a motive that they dreaded. On the day of April's disappearance, he had been sending messages to multiple unknown women online, inviting them for drinks. In the hours leading up to the abduction, Bridger had been viewing indecent images of minors, watching violent, explicit videos, and even looking at explicit cartoons depicting children. He had also saved pictures of April and her older sister Jasmine on his laptop. This was so he could view them whenever he wanted. The revelation of Mark's secrets discredited his first accounts of an accident. This pretty much proved it to be one major lie. It strongly suggested that his motive for April's murder was likely carnal in nature. On October the 6th, Mark Bridger was officially charged with child abduction, with murder, and attempting to pervert the course of justice. He made an appearance before magistrates in Aberystwyth on October the 8th. There he faced the additional charge of the unlawful concealment and disposal of a body. He was put into custody and held at HMP Manchester pending an appearance at court which took place on October the 10th. As the case unfolded, it was revealed that two years before April's murder, Mark Bridger had attempted to contact April's older sister Jasmine when she was just 14 years old through Facebook. Not recognising him, Jasmine asked why he was trying to message her. Bridger replied, I am friends with your dad, Paul. Puzzled by this response, Jasmine asked her father about this man who claimed to be his friend. Paul, her father, was equally surprised. Up to that point, his interactions with Bridger had been limited to occasional greetings when they passed each other in the street, and to his recollection, nothing more. Despite the mounting evidence against him, Mark Bridger clung to his story that April's death had been an accident. However, the police had now gathered enough evidence to lock him up for the abduction and murder of April Jones. The trial began on April 29th, 2013. Mark Bridger pleaded not guilty. He took the stand, maintaining his version of events as an accident. The jury was presented with tons of evidence against him, including blood evidence, bone fragments, and his fixation on inappropriate content involving minors. During the trial, Bridger attempted to convince a jury that he had those indecent images on his laptop because he was trying to educate his own children about the different stages of growth and development. He claimed he genuinely believed that viewing violent explicit content was a way to teach his children about their teenage years. On May the 13th, 2013, Mark Bridger, at the age of 46, was found guilty of the abduction and murder of April Jones. 
He was also convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice, of disposing of and concealing April's body. Mark Bridger received a life sentence in prison with a recommendation that he should never be released. To this day, he has never admitted his guilt or provided details of what transpired on that day. This leaves April's family with unanswered questions and the pain of never truly knowing the full extent of the circumstances surrounding April's death. On September 26, 2013, just five days before the first anniversary of April's death, her funeral was finally held. Hundreds of people gathered to support the grieving family and to pay their respects. In November 2013, Mark Bridges' cottage was purchased by the Welsh Government. It was then subsequently demolished. The removal of this painful reminder brought a sense of relief to April's family, making sure that they wouldn't be constantly confronted with the place where April had met her end, having to see it on a daily basis. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Remember, and do remember to hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.